My topic is sun and vitamin D deficiency in the effluent society. And um, I'm going to talk to you about some special properties of vitamin D. But it is in the larger context. And this is the effluent society. And the problem is depicted very nicely. You see the people on the right side, that's the input. On the other side, you have the output. And in between, there is the put-put. The question is, what does the put-put do to the people that they get so intensively changed? The one question. The next question is, how can it be that not only a few people are affected, but almost the whole population? Yeah? You see over there the population in the chart in the swamp and the medical staff should get it out of the swamp. They won't be able to do that because the chart is too much down the swamp. So we have to find different ways to solve the health problem different from what we are doing today. And in this idea, vitamin D has big importance. How does this connection look like? Is vitamin D just another hype? We had the hype with vitamin A, the hype with vitamin B, with vitamin E, and now comes somebody and says, oh, vitamin D, vitamin D. It's not a hype. If you want to understand vitamin D, you have to look back billions of years at the beginning of life. And even at that time, the sun was shining. So all the life on Earth is depending on the sunshine. And if the WHO today says sunshine is toxic, obviously they got something different which was toxic to their mind. Yeah? The sun can't be toxic. It has been shining all the day. Without the sun, there would be no life at all. So it's, the problem is the other way around. Obviously, we changed our way of life with regard to the sun, and that's the problem, and I'm going to show that. Thousands of years ago, people had a different aspect, a different attitude to the sun. They worshipped the sun. It was a lord. And in Egypt, for instance, they offered their naked child to the sun. Today, if you put a naked child in the sun, some dermatologists will run around and say, it's stupid, stupid people. It's not stupid. Even small children can stand the sun, not so long as a grown-up, but they can do it. Yeah. Today, for us, the perception of environment is completely changed. It's only negative. We have the toxic material in the environment. We have the pesticides, the hormones, the radiation. We have all the bacteria, the fungi, and parasites, and we have tsunami and earthquakes. So for us, the environment is bad. But this is a very strong impression. It's a wrong impression because we are living from the environment. We need the environment, not this man-made environment with all the examples of the negative factors, um, pesticides, cigarette smoking, and all that. But we need the environment, the positive effects. Um, this is, again, in the household, you have fluoride, aluminium. It makes your brain uh, sick. All these things are bad. But on the other hand, there's a lot in the environment which is necessary. We need the environment for our health. We are depending on these resources from the environment. Every gram of your body comes from the environment. So if we change the environment in the wrong way, it will be negative for us and we have the effect already, we get sick. It's hard to believe, but if you look at this example, it's some 40 years ago, and there was, we celebrated the victory over men about the gravity. We were able to be in the space. This was actually very impressive. But on the other hand, when they came back, there were young, trained athletes. When they came back, they had muscle loss and osteoporosis. So what happened to them? Easy. They had no gravity. Nobody is thinking about gravity on the Earth. You are sitting on your chairs, okay? I'm happy that the liquid stays in the bottle, not goes out. But 
we don't think about gravity. But we know in between that the gravity is necessary for the information of the body how to work. It's information by gravity and it's information by many other things also. Also vitamin D gives information to the cell. So it's the same effect. Gravity is a natural resource nature gives us and we are no longer thinking about it. Yeah? So nobody of us is an astronaut, but if you look at your usual physical activity, you should do at least 2.5 hours per week. And you see a, a, a new study from Germany, Bundesgesundheitsamt, these are the results. The ladies are, you may forget, and even the young men, it's only 40% who are reg uh, exercising regularly. So it's not enough. So this influence of the body is not there, and we get sick. 70 to 80 percent of all people in Germany failed to put into practice this 2.5 hours of activity. Look at that. Even those people going to the fitness center, they're using this escalator instead of the staircase. Stupid. I've been looking for this problem now for 10 years and I found almost 20 different resources of everyday life. It starts with physical factors. I we man, uh, mentioned the gravity, but it's as well the magnetic field, the sunlight I'm talking about, the oxygen, the clear water, silence and darkness. Then we have the biological factors, the micronutrients, the minerals, the fat, the energy, hunger and fasting. We lost hunger and fasting. We eat several times per day, but formerly several days per week there was nothing to eat. So we lost even this. And then again the mental factors. Meaningful work, social bonds, spirituality, all these things are gone in our modern societies and all these are resources. We need them. So if we talk about solar energy, people think about electrical energy. They don't think about solar energy for their body, but we need it very intensively. And it's not a new problem. 100 years ago, we had the same problem in Europe uh, with the children, they got uh, rickets. And the reason was the industry making so much smoke, the children living in the backyards of the factories, they got not enough sun. And then they solved the problem by making artificial sun. Some colleague got a Nobel Prize for the artificial sun. And today, medicine says it's dangerous. So, is the Nobel Prize correct or is this new idea correct or bad? I think I'm showing the opposite. Sunshine and cancer, there are two faces of the same thing. We have higher energy radiation which indeed leads to a damage of the skin. There is no question. It is responsible for the non-malignant melanoma cancer. But we have an uncertain situation with regard to the malignant melanoma. On the other side, we have different bands of radiation in the light of the sun, which also produce healthy things. Just some years ago, they found out that UVA the bad guy UVA nobody needs, we need it. It lowers the blood pressure. UVA lowers the blood pressure. So if you go to the sun, you have a lower blood pressure. In Germany, 50% of the people have high blood pressure, yeah? eating some pills against it. If they would go to the sun, they had a better effect. And vitamin D activates more than 1,000 genes. That means the vitamin D is not only there for the bones, but it's actually influencing the cells on the level of the genes. And this is effective in chronic diseases. So, the question is the dose with everything, not only with the sunlight. If you think about red wine, a glass of red wine together with a meal is healthy. If you drink three bottles of red wine, it's no longer healthy. Even water. You need two liters of water. If you drink 10 liters of water, you get sick. So it's a question of dosing. Uh, dose is the, the poison. Uh, one thing is for sure. The sunscreen is not the solution to the problem. If you see, you see in red the sails 
in millions of dollars from 1972 to 2005, and you see the incidence of melanoma. So there is no chance that the sunscreen you stop the melanoma. I can't pretend that they cause each other, but at least there is no health in it. But this is more important. This has been published by an American colleague who is a cutaneous pathologist. That means he does nothing else than looking for um, pathology of the skin. So he knows what he's talking about. And he took a closer look to the melanoma statistics, which are rising like that. And then he found out that in actually, since 90, the incidence went up very, very intensively. But astonishingly, it's only the early form of the melanoma. It's not the late forms and it's not the death. You see here the late forms and you see the cases of death and they didn't go up as well. So you said, what happened? If only a small part of the population takes part into the screening, that means one third, the other two thirds develop the malignant melanoma, the early stages, then they get worse, the late stage, and then they die. So if the idea is true that we are having more and more malignant melanomas, then more people should die from malignant melanoma. More people should have late forms of malignant melanoma. They are not there. And then he asked in this paper the question, can it be that this diagnosis of malignant melanoma in the early stage is wrong? That we say a cancer or that we diagnose a cancer which is no cancer at all, which may be tuned to a normal cell back again. We have to look at that. So all this, what is pretended to be true, is not yet true. And we have the same situation with the breast cancer in the women. 30% of the breast cancer, case, cancer, uh, breast cancer cases diagnosed today will never give at the breast cancer. They have done the study in, in Norway or in Sweden, looked for women for 10 years, and whether they got operated or not, and after 10 years, there was the same situation, whether they got operated or not. So it's very, very difficult, and we have to take care not to get afraid of something which is not existing. On the other hand, the question is, why is vitamin D so important? And there are several new informations we have. The first, it's not a vitamin, it's a hormone or a pre-hormone. And you know hormones you produce yourself in your glands. You have not to eat it. So the next thing is, it's not only for bone, but more than 1,000 different genes are regulated by vitamin D. Brain, vessels, muscles, liver, and also and show you more. 17 kinds, cancer kinds are sensitive to vitamin D. So the big problem of cancer in general, not only the melanoma is sensible. And more important, it modulates the innate and the acquired immune system. So without vitamin D, your immune system goes the wrong direction. And it protects the cardiovascular system. Two-thirds of the population in the effluent societies are going to die from cardiovascular disease, two-thirds. And vitamin D helps to protect. I'm going to show studies like that. And it improves bone and muscle function that we know a longer time. And another thing which is new, the majority of the population is deficient, not only some kids and some old people. So I show you some results which we got from 5,000 specimens in the rhine main area. And you see it's going up and down. You have the lowest values in February and March, the highest values in July, and then it goes down in November. But we have another small peak in December. And the colleague who did the study said, oh, I have made some mistake. How can it be? On Christmas, vitamin D, where can it come from? And I said, can't be a mistake. With 5,000 cases, together we have in every month 400 cases. So it must be true. What happened? And then we got the idea. 
Rhein-Main area has a big airport, and when the weather is, conditions are very bad, people jump to the next plane, go somewhere to Africa or South America, get there a lot of vitamin D, and come back with this vitamin D in their body. But after a while, it is gone. And in April, it's finished. Now, it's finally gone. This already is not good, having up and downs. But the actual problem is this steep here. These values are the problem, because they are the highest values, but they are insufficient, because the red line over here is not to support the title. It's my reference value. There we should be, at the red line, and not there. That means all people in this 5,000 specimens were vitamin D deficient. They have not enough vitamin D even in the summertime, not only in wintertime. So it's a huge problem. Yeah. <clears throat> you see here the population, the German population, the same values depending on the age of the population. And you see that only the small kids in the first year of life have normal values then all other kids and all the grown-ups, the adults, are deficient. How can that be? That the small child have enough vitamin D? It's simple. They get it. They are supplemented. If anything in the German healthcare system works, it's the supplementation of the small kids. They all get vitamin D. The problem is, and it helps against the rickets, there are no rickets in Germany, but the problem is that after one year, people say, oh, the children are grown up now, they can walk, they can go outside and produce their vitamin D themselves. And they drop the supplementation, and this drops the value, because the children do no longer go out. They sit inside, looking at the PlayStation or the, the television. And when they go out, the mother takes sunscreen and put them sunscreen on. And I'm going to show you what the sunscreen happened. So we have a huge problem. All the kids, all the grown-ups, we have as low values of vitamin D. You may say now that these people are sick. And if you are sick, you do no longer go out. And because you do not go out, you have a low level. So that's the other way around. We say they have a little low value of vitamin D, so get, they get sick. The other people say, no, no, no. They get sick from something else, and then they have a low value because they are sick. I cannot argue with these values against that because these were patients. But we have values from a normal population, and this is this one. This is done by an official institution in Germany, the Robert Koch Institute, and they looked for children, as we did it, and again, only the young children in the first year of life, here's the year of life, first year of life, normal, and then the supplementation is dropped, and then everything is in deficiency. And they did the differentiation between non-migrants and migrants. The non-migrants are the German uh, children, and the migrants uh, come from abroad. And you see, those migrants with a darker skin have a bigger problem. They are 20% still lower than the German population. Why? Because the pigmentation is like sunscreen. It protects against radiation. So these poor people are not only away from their home, they are also more sun deficient, more vitamin D deficient than we here. So this is a problem, and we can say it's not a question of sickness or disease, it's a question of the population and how it behaves. And again, it's not a question of Germany or a question of America. Look at that, that's India. India is very much sun afforded. What happened there, published 2000, 80% of the men and people in the um, rural area and also urban areas, they are deficient. So worldwide, Non, no longer depending on the latitude, are deficient. Why? Because we have the same style of life. Yeah. How can this happen? Yeah. Professor Hollick is an American colleague. He showed that if you put somebody in the sun, young people, 
It takes only half an hour to an hour, and he produces a huge amount of vitamin D. 10,000, 15,000 units. It works all at once. And then, after a while, it goes down, and after a week, it's gone. It's used. But it works only with the young people. If you are elderly, and I'm very grateful that he wrote elderly and not old, I'm Miss Gossam also, as elderly people, it does not work so good. So there is a part of the population who is um, more in danger in the risk. But the actual problem is, if you put sunscreen on, you're making yourself to the elderly. Look at that. Without sunscreen, young people with sunscreen, the reaction is no longer there. Why? Sunscreen protects against radiation, UVB radiation. And this means you are no longer able to produce vitamin D in your, sun, in your skin when you put on sunscreen. And look, he took sun factor, sunscreen factor 8. Nobody is using 8 today. 15, 20, 30, but not 8. So if you go out to the sun and put on sunscreen, you have bad chances to make vitamin D. But it's not only that. We have the other problem with veiling clothes. If you put on a veil, the sun cannot go through the veil. And so you get vitamin D deficient. I've made this picture in India because the women had this, were colored and had these veils. Later, only later I saw that there's a child on this picture. And this child wears jeans, long trousers, in the sun. So even in the sunny side of India, he's making no vitamin D. He's vitamin D deficient. Yeah? In addition, he has a dark skin, and uh, so he will be more deficient. That means it's our lifestyle which is responsible for the vitamin D production or not. So, clear? Santa Claus won't make any vitamin D when he goes like that to the sun. Now you may say, I'm not Santa Claus going to the sun with gloves and a hat. Maybe not with this sort of hat, but look at that. He's mountain biking. He is doing leisure sports and he has special clothing for that. He has a hat on, he has gloves on. He comes home at the evening, he gets 10 points for cycling, no point for vitamin D. He's vitamin D deficient, even though he was outside the whole day. The surfers in Hawaii are vitamin D deficient. Either they have a suit on or they put on sunscreen and that blocks the sun. So they are vitamin D deficient. I apologize, not everybody is deficient. But they have another problem I'm not talking about today. So, this is my vitamin D barometer, and you can look. If you have a vitamin D level higher than 30 nanograms or 75 nanomoles, the labs cannot find one value. So, some of them measure in nanograms, other nanomoles. But it's easy to calculate, it's 2.5 a factor. So, if you have more than 30 nanogram per milliliter in your blood, you have a good future without a bigger risk for diseases. If you have lower values under 20, it is mixed. And if you have values lower than 20, you have a high risk to develop chronic disease. You won't cut down dead, but you have a higher risk to develop chronic disease. And I'm showing you some special features. It starts in pregnancy and even before pregnancy. If you have a young couple who want to have children, they have to have enough vitamin D, otherwise it won't function. It is necessary in the men that the sperms can swim. It is necessary in the women that the um, fertile fat implants into the placenta. It preserves a, a regular course of the pregnancy. It supports the fetal growth. Vitamin D supports the fetal growth. It controls the secretion of multiple placental hormones. And it limits inflammatory cytokines. That means if you have low vitamin D, you have a higher risk that this pregnancy does not come out healthy. 
And we have a study, a huge study who shows that. It was Professor Hollis who has done it that. And he inv investigated 600 women. One half got 4,000 units. At that time, 10 years ago, when he started the study, it was a huge amount. So he had to ask the ethical committee whether it was allowed to do it. And he generously gave 400 units as placebo. That is the amount the Society of uh, Nutrition recommend as usual dose. He gave it as placebo for the whole pregnancy. And what came out? Minus 50% preterm birth, minus 30% infections during pregnancy, and minus 30% all problems in pregnancy. So it's worthwhile to have it. And the second thing was he gave mothers who were breastfeeding 6,000 units of vitamin D. And all at once, there was vitamin D in the breast milk. The experts have been discussing for years, for years, for years, why is there not enough vitamin D in the breast milk? Because if this would be, we wouldn't have to supplement the children. And now we know why. If the mother is vitamin D deficient, she cannot put it in the milk. If mother has enough vitamin D, she can put it in the milk and no problem. So it works. Let us talk about cardiovascular disease. The new study, some, some weeks only old, has been published some weeks ago. The people who had problems with the kidney, there were insufficient kidneys, and they were supplemented with vitamin D. And you can see in the beginning, this was their endothelium blood flow, and was, that was the blood flow after supplementation of six weeks. It doubled. So that blood flow doubled due to vitamin D within several weeks. Another example from Germany. We had a cohort of 3,000 people who had myocardial infarction, and they were followed up for eight years. And the lines you see are the dying rate. And you can see that the mortality of those who had, okay, here, who had a high level of vitamin D is low, only 10%, 12%, and those with a low level of vitamin D is very high, it's 35%. So it's a factor of three or four, risk factor of three or four. The same is true for cardiac mortality. mortality. It's not so many cases because it's only cardiac mortality. These were all mortality cases, but again the same. If you have low vitamin D level, you have um, almost 25% who died within f uh, eight years, and if you have a high level, it were only 8% who died. So even if you have a chronic disease, it's very important to have enough vitamin D for a better survival. Let's look at cancer. Breast cancer, the most frequent cancer in women, and you see, with a low value, there's the risk put on one. And if you have a high value of vitamin D in animals, you have a third of the risk. Or if you put it in the other way, we can save seven out of 10 women the bad situation of getting breast cancer. Seven out of 10 women have unnecessary breast cancer because they are vitamin D deficient. The same is true for colorectal cancer. And colorectal cancer is the second uh, most cancer for both sexes, for men and women. And you see identical, all, every point is a study. All these studies show the more vitamin D you have, the lower is the risk. And even if you have a cancer, so it's happened that you have a cancer, it's good to have a normal value. They look for 500 female patients with a breast cancer for 10 years, and those who had a low level had 90% higher risk to die and a 73% higher risk of mortality because they had a lower vitamin D level. The reason for that is that vitamin D protects against cancer. Vitamin D tells the cancer cells not to multiply not to migrate, to sit down and keep rest every time. 
So even if the tumor is there, if you have vitamin D enough, it will stop the cancer. Often enough, somebody says, you and your vitamin D, it's all in stories you are telling. You don't have the real truth. And the real truth you only get if you're doing studies like the pharmaceutical companies. That means double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized and prospective. We have such studies. Look at that, cancer risk. 1,179 women aged 55 years got supplemented with 15 milligram calcium and 1,100 milligram of vitamin D, or placebo, for four years. It was an osteoporosis study. But somebody said, oh, let us have a look for cancer. Not only fracture, also cancer. It's no big problem, let us have a look. They did, they looked. What happened? After four years, risk reduction in 80% in the supplemented group for cancer. Now the statistical people say, it's only 1,100 women. You should do it with 11,000. I have to say, if it works with 1,100, I'm doing it on my own, because 1,100 is enough for me to have a good argument. Risk reduction, 80%. The same is true for the immune system. And again, the picture of the pregnancy, it works, it starts in the pregnancy. This is a complicated uh, scheme, I won't explain it all, but you have a mother cell on the left, and from this cell all the immune cells are developed. And on the right side you see vitamin D and the influence of vitamin D. There are some cells stimulated by vitamin D and other cells are reduced by vitamin D. So vitamin D tunes our immune system. And if you have not enough vitamin D, your system, your immune system is wrong tuned. You have a, if you have a motor which is wrong tuned, he doesn't work correctly, you can't drive. If you have a wrong tuned immune system, you get sick and different sickness. And this is the consequence. If you have enough vitamin D, it protects against allergies and autoimmune diseases. It's um, the Crohn, the diabetes, rheumatism and all this. Because you are tuned in the right way. But also in the later immune system, it produces naturally antibody. We have cured tuberculosis formerly. Yeah? The people who went to Switzerland to cure tuberculosis were put into the sun. It took them one year to get healthy again, but it worked. Then came the antibiotics, it worked quicker, and people forgot about it. But it works also against viruses. And every year, every winter time, we have the problem with the uh, viruses, infections, influenza. If we have enough vitamin, we won't get this. I'll show you the things. This is the situation in our blood. Very, very complicated, many, many different cells, and these cells all talk together. And at every place where I have put this arrow, these cells talk together, and they don't speak, but they produce so-called cytokines. They talk with cytokines with each other. And the cytokine production is dependent on vitamin D. If you do not have enough vitamin D, they cannot produce the cytokines. And if you then have a virus coming into the blood, like influenza, then these cells cannot work because they cannot understand each other. And they can only work when they work together. So they need vitamin D to work. And this is the reason why we have so many diseases in wintertime so many colds in wintertime. We have a low level of vitamin D, we get infected, and then we have the problem for a whole week. If the body is intact, if the immune system works, it takes to 24 hours or 48 hours, and then it's gone, but only when vitamin D is there. Again, we have a double-blind controlled study with vitamin D in school children with regard to infection. The Japanese people did it. They gave late in the year, in December, to the school children a good dose of 1,200 units and looked what happened. Half of them got vitamin D, the other half not. 
those getting vitamin D had a 64% reduction in infection in the months in the winter. This is an amount you get with no vaccination. You never get 64% effect, but you get it with vitamin D. And in addition, in both groups, there were children who had asthma. You may remember, asthma comes from a wrongly tuned immune system in the body of the mother. They are punished for their whole life. And when those people get infection, they get an exasperation, so the asthma get complex and here. In both groups were asthma children, and we had an 80% reduction in asthma attacks by vitamin D. Just giving some drops of vitamin D helps those chins. The muscles in the skeletal system. We were thinking we know everybody about that after a decade or several decades, but even there are new informations. Vitamin D helps not only for a better bone density, but also for muscular strength. And if you have a better balance, if you have better functioning legs, you have a lower risk of falling. And if you don't fall, you don't break your bones. So we have a double line where vitamin D helps the elderly people not to get fractures. Apropos elderly people, if you have an age like me, you have a good chance to go into an asylum for old patients or old people. And again, this is dependent on the vitamin D level. We have put the vitamin D level of 70, that is 30 nanograms, as risk factor one. And you see each step down will make a higher risk for going to the asylum. And it goes 3.5 fold that you, go, that you become institutionalized. Why? Easy to explain. Vitamin D is everywhere, in your brain, in your muscle, in your heart, in your liver. And when you have not enough vitamin D, you get a reduced function of all these organs. And this makes you no longer stable enough to live alone and you have to go to an institution. Neurological diseases. Whatever neurological disease is, they are all affected by vitamin D. Why? All the nerve cells have vitamin D receptors. If they are filled with vitamin D, the nerves function. If not, they get sick. The difference is only the individual risk you have from your ancestors. And therefore, depends whether you get dementia or Parkinson or schizophrenia. But the reason that vitamin D is involved is everywhere the same. We have some information from America. They did the first studies looking at the huge countryside in which areas there were more cases of multiple sclerosis. And they made an order that the dark areas have a high risk and the white areas a low risk. And you see that all along the border to Canada, there's a lot more of multiple sclerosis patient than in the south. You can also describe it another way. You see here the latitude. 28 degrees, that's Florida, and this here is Canada, or Germany, it's the same, 50 degrees. And you see the incidence of multiple sclerosis goes up by a factor of five. So obviously there is something in the land that makes people sick or not. It's certainly not the influence of the Canadian people on the Americans. It's the sun which becomes less. And we have another publication from the Iran when in Iran was the revolution, they got strongly, strongly religious and all the women were covered, were veiled. And in Iran, we have an incidence sevenfold of multiple sclerosis compared to before the revolution. So the consequences of this re religious veiling is sevenfold multiple sclerosis has been published. No? Alzheimer. Nobody wants to get Alzheimer disease, but if you are vitamin D deficient, your risk gets higher. You see, all these are different studies. There's only one study on the left where you, the risk goes a little bit down. All the rest shows with vitamin D deficiency, your risk goes up. So it's another aspect why it is good to have enough vitamin D. 
On the other hand, there is the argument vitamin D is toxic. If you take too much of vitamin D, you get sick and ill. We have again for that studies. They used the multiple sclerosis patients as guinea pigs and they gave them high doses of vitamin D. 7,000, not units, but microgram. You have to multiply it with 40. That means 280,000 units per week, huge amount. In consequence, we got a very high level of vitamin D in the blood. It's almost 400 nanomoles. It's Nobody wants that, but they tried it. And the question was, is there any change in the calcium level in the blood of these people? So they measured the calcium, and what happened? Nothing happened. Starting point, baseline, 7,000 microgram, nothing happened. So we are not dosing as high. We are dosing maybe 5,000, 8,000. No fear, nothing happened. So we have no uh, fear to have an overdose. Vitamin D is safe, except you're making stupid things with it or you're giving adult doses to children. When children get for a long time adult doses, they get sick, naturally, but there's a manifold dose, so no problem. But the lifestyle is dependent and it depends what we do in our lifestyle and we can change it. We can say, okay, I go through to three to four times per week, half an hour into the sun. It is sufficient. Or I go once or twice per month in a, on a sunbed for 15 minutes. Or I take a vitamin D supplement. For me as a scientist, the goal of a sufficient vitamin D supply is achieved. There may be some minor changes, but you can do either or or. There are no, some differences. If you go to the sun, it costs no money. It's very good, but you need abundant time and you need the time at a certain time of the day. Because when you go to the sun in the afternoon or in the early morning, it won't work. The sun must be higher than 45 degrees on the horizon. Most of you won't be able to measure 45 degrees, but it's very easy to measure. You turn around, the sun behind you, and you look at the shadow. If your shadow is longer than your height, the sun is lower than 45 degrees, so you can easily measure it. And as soon as the sun is lower than 45 degrees, it's no longer necessary or useful to go out. And this is in Germany or Central Europe from October to March. And even in the, um, the summer, it's between 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock. So when you take your car, have the roof open and go with the car, and oh, nice sun at four o'clock. It's warm, it's UVA, but no UVB. It's absorbed by the atmosphere. So you have to go during high noon. But if you are not able to go there at that time, it's lost. Or like today, if there are clouds, you won't be able to go there. So it's a problem. You say, okay, I go to the sunbed, it costs some money, but it costs less time, only a quarter of an hour, and I can go there whenever I want. Any day, even in the night, I can go there when it's open. Or I take vitamin D, it costs money, and I can take it, the pill, just whenever I like. So there is no longer an excuse from anybody, I can't do it, because, because, because. He can do that, or can do that, or can do that. So everybody is able to get enough vitamin D. It sounds as if vitamin D is a new silver bullet, the sole fountain of use. Mm -mm. That's not true, certainly not. If you don't eat in a proper way, all the vitamin D is nothing. If you don't move, all vitamin D is nothing. So you have to behave in a certain way. Why is vitamin D so important? Why is there so much attention with vitamin D? The reason is the following. It's a hormone. It's a hormone like thyroid hormone. And I have put or looked at the deficiencies and you have for the thyroid hormone only 5 to 10% of people who ever gets in their life vitamin D def uh, thyroid hormone deficient. But you have 70 to 90% who get vitamin D deficient. This is the reason why vitamin D is so important. Why 
There are meanwhile 20,000 papers published about vitamin D because so many people are deficient and it has not been known. This is the reason why it is so much in the papers today. Last year I made a conference in Berlin and the dermatologists, some of them, said according to the latest scientific evidence it can be assumed that a moderate and not too intensive exposure to the sunlight the protecting effect by vitamin D outweighs the cancer promoting effect. So it's useful to do it in a moderate way and not to say go, don't go there at all. We have to go there. And in the light of these findings, the dermatological recommendations should be changed with regard to the sun protection. It is not good if they say don't go to the sun, it's dangerous. Everybody or whoever this says has to tell the people then you won't make vitamin D and you will get sick in another way. So we have to balance the things. So I summary. Vitamin D is a pre-hormone and not a vitamin. It regulates about a thousand genes. Seventeen kinds of cancer are sensitive and it modulates the innate and the acquired immune system. It protects against the, uh, the cardiovascular system and the nerve cells and it improves muscle and bone function. So there is no part of the body who does not improve with vitamin D. Um, and the majority of the population is deficient, therefore it's a big problem for the whole population. So if we look at the solar energy and look at the little sister which we have in the sun beds, there are some advantages. It is at hand at any time, independent from the season or from the day or the weather. It is well defined and reproducible in the radiation. We never know how strong is the sun outside. Maybe there are clouds, there may be some dust from Africa like uh, today, or there may be uh, a very clear situation. So, this is not reproducible. The small sister is reproducible. And we can take into account by calculating the times, the skin type and the individual pigmentation. If people go out, lie in the sun, nobody looks for the pigmentation. So we have a safety in application. If you go out in the, in the sun, you have no safety. Yeah? And again, we have an optimal whole body exposure. We got two square meters of skin which we can expose in case it is warm enough, in case it is allowed to strip. In the sunbed, you can go there naked and you can produce vitamin D with the whole body and not only with the face. But for both UVB sources, the big old son and her small little sister, the same rule is true. And I already told you, the dose making the problem. So if you go regularly in a moderate way, there is no problem at all. And thank you for your attention. In case there are questions, you may put them. Oh, take please the microphone. Yeah. Which factors can decrease your vitamin D level in your blood even if you take enough sunshine or taking enough supplements? What other factors can decrease it in your blood? It's used. It's simply used. The body cells need the vitamin D and they use it. So if you have a certain amount, it's, it has a half time of about eight weeks. It goes long down. It is used. So if you do not go regularly to the sun, and reproduce the vitamin D, after a while, you get lost. We had the chance to measure it with the people in the submarines. There's no sun at all. And they had a regular value when they started, and then you know, they could count it. Yeah? And they could measure when they did some uh, uh, either external radiation or supplementation, how the level got up. So they did a lot of experiments in this way. Yeah? Okay. Hello. In Italy, uh, I appreciate your study, but in Italy it's not possible to make tan at pregnant and under 18. 
Yeah. It's good. Your, your study is very interesting. But how an uh, um, prof um, pro Italian professional could uh, explain that to, the, um, to, the, um, to our uh, yeah. guests? It's a very bad situation. We have in Germany the same situation for the children under 18. Yeah? They do no longer allow it. Because, but for me, it's stupid. Because we have lived in the sun. The smallest child, whenever it starts running, it's, it has been naked in the sun. So it's stupid. But there's a huge lobby working against it. And they're shooting at you. Yeah? And they have their profit from this. Selling sunscreen, cutting out melanomas, which are no melanomas. We have a statistic that in private practice, up to 20 times are done a cutting before one malignant melanoma is found. In a good university, they do three cuttings for one melanoma. They cut 20. So it's almost overboard. But it's their interest to say, and, and then the people come. So you won't be able to go against that. It has be the, or the organizers, like here, have to bring the things into account. They have, again, make such studies. They cost money, but we can only insist and say it's a healthy thing, and if you are not healthy, you have the bad things. And even those studies are done sometimes in a bad way. They are paid so they get the wrong thing around. It's very problematic, but we have to, to unify all people who are thinking about the ancient life, the paleo life. There's now a new movement coming from America, paleo. That means paleolithic. What we have been doing in the Stone Age, we should do today. Not in the same way, because we change in modern life, but what we have done at that time, running around, eating the right food, going out to the sun, this we have to find modern ways to replace it in our way. And a sunbed is a modern way to get enough sun, because people are working indoors. In earlier times, everybody was working outside. It was easy to get sun. And nobody chose inside working. It's today the industry who works inside, because working inside makes more money than outside. So it's the whole society who has changed in the wrong direction. And there are big players who get money or take money out of this situation, and we have to fight that. Yeah? OK. Any other question? So if not, then thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>